Faith for Today with Colin Urquhart and Julia Fisher. Colin, we're looking ahead now, of course, to Christmas, and uh, you're going to take us to the prophecy of Isaiah just to look at some of the some of the things that were said about Jesus long before he was born. Yes, we're going to look at some of the prophecies that look towards the coming of the Messiah. And uh, we have to always remember that the birth of Jesus did not just happen by chance. It was something that was very carefully planned by God even before the creation of the world. And therefore, although the prophecies of Isaiah were written about 700 years before Jesus was born, nevertheless, there are some very clear prophetic words about not only his coming, but the significance of his coming and what he would accomplish when he came. So we're going to look at some of these. Uh, But first of all, from Isaiah 40, we're going to look at the prophecy that concerned John the Baptist. Now, you remember that John the Baptist was sent by God to prepare the way for the coming of Jesus. He was uh, the forerunner. He was the one who was to be used by God to change the spiritual atmosphere that existed at the time uh, in Jerusalem, Judea, so that Uh, the ministry of Jesus would come into a situation where people were already beginning to be God-conscious in a new way. Remember, there hadn't been the voice of prophecy for over 400 years in the land. And Jesus said that John the Baptist was more than a prophet. Now, in Isaiah chapter 40, we read, "'Comfort, comfort my people,' says your God." Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now, to comfort is to give strength to his people. So God is going to do something now to give his people the spiritual strength that they need. And the third verse of this chapter is quoted, of course, about, directly about John the Baptist. A voice of one calling, in the desert prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Now you remember that John the Baptist lived in the desert, he lived in the wilderness, But, of course, that is symptomatic of the spiritual desert and the spiritual wilderness that happened at the time of Jesus. Every valley shall be raised up, the prophecy continues. Every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged places are plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken." Uh, when God speaks his purpose into being, then, of course, it is going to happen. It's simply a question of God's timing. So although these words were written hundreds of years before, in God's appointed time, the Son of God would be born, and before that, of course, John the Baptist would fulfill his ministry. The prophecy continues. A voice says, cry out, and I said, what shall I cry? Now, here is the state of mankind that existed when Jesus was born into the world. All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. And of course, when Jesus came, he came as the word of God. John, in the opening of his gospel, says, the word was made flesh and lived among us, the word that God had used to bring all creation into being. 
Then the prophecy continues in Isaiah 40, You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, Here is your God. Now this is John the Baptist fulfilling his ministry. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. So this is talking about the coming of the shepherd that God would supply. Now, this is a very, very important um, aspect of the truth because you remember that Jesus, during his ministry, described himself as the good shepherd. And in the prophecy of Ezekiel, God was very unhappy with the shepherds of Israel. Um, he really condemns them because they've lived for themselves rather than for the good of the people. Uh, in Isaiah 34, we read, this is what the sovereign Lord says, woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? Then he says a little later, You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So what is the Lord going to do about this? He says, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable from, for my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths and it will be no, no longer be food for them. Now, how is he going to do this? For this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. And he goes on to say, I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel. And he says, I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. So what God is saying prophetically is those who had the responsibility of shepherding his people had really failed to do so because of their concern for themselves rather than for the flock. And you see that in the teaching of Jesus, especially in the way in which he related to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. So now God himself is going to fulfill this prophecy. He is going to intervene. He is going to send his own son to be the true shepherd, the good shepherd. Good shepherd, you see, uh, compared with the bad shepherds, the, sh the shepherds that had failed, the, the shepherds uh, of Israel. So uh, we see in, in Jesus the fulfillment of these prophecies. And that's very, very exciting because today, all those who know the Lord Jesus in a personal way know him as the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. And it's by no accident that, of course, when the child was born in Bethlehem, the angel appeared to shepherds in the fields. Uh, you know that God, God never does anything haphazardly. He always has meaning. There's always significance in everything he does. And you see, shepherds come to worship the child because he is going to be the shepherd. Just as the wise men came because 
Jesus Christ is our wisdom from God. So it's as if God sort of arranges the whole scenario, and you see these different people coming to worship, coming to pay homage to this baby, even though at that time he hadn't accomplished anything. But God knew that the child that was born in that stable in Bethlehem was the one who was to become, destined to become our wisdom from God, the one who would give us salvation. He was destined to be the, the good shepherd that would lay down his life for the sheep. He said, I, I haven't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. So even though we look forward to the birth of Jesus, we know that that birth will end in a death that is absolutely crucial to the salvation of mankind. And it is only because, uh, because of that death that we are able to rejoice and be glad at, at, at this season of Christmas. It wouldn't have been enough just for the Son of God to come and share our life for a few years here on earth. He had to do whatever was necessary to make it possible for us to receive his life, to become part of his kingdom, and actually to become, if we continue this analogy through, to become the sheep of his pasture, to become those that he would lead in the way that he wants us to go, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. So we can rejoice today in everything that Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. You've been listening to Faith for Today, presented by Julia Fisher. This program is sponsored by Kingdom Faith. For further information, visit our website, kingdomfaith.com. 